Hi there, in this video I'm going to be talking through the design and implementation of a third person cover system I've been working on in Unreal Engine 5. This is my first proper project working with C++ and Unreal Engine, so if you see any terrible looking lines of code or if you have any recommendations at all then I'd really appreciate any tips and pointers in the comments. So the first thing I had to think about was the kind of system I actually wanted to make. I've made a couple of similar things to a cover system in Unity before, but a lot of these were physics-based, meaning I'd often use real-time raycasting to place the player in the correct location, and then keep raycasting when the player moves. And that's great when you've got weird meshes that are kind of deforming and animating in real-time, and as long as your system is robust enough, the player should just be able to respond to those. But there are a lot of downsides to that strategy as well. For example, it's harder to have complete control over where the player goes, and shooting multiple rays in real time is quite inefficient. And it can be quite error prone as well, because you don't know where the player is going to be. So it could be that the case that there's loads of weird angles that they could be shot at in positions that you didn't actually think about when uh, making, making the bit of cover. On the other end of the spectrum is some kind of rail system where you define a path that the player can move on to go around the cover. And you just attach to this and slide along it. With this system, there is a little bit more setup to do with creating a system that you can actually create these rails with and define them. And because I wanted to make a cover system similar to that in Hitman or Uncharted, I went with this Rails approach, where the bits of cover are clearly defined. And also for my system, I did simplify and only use straight tracks, although curved tracks are something that I definitely want to add in the future. When thinking about the design of this system, I thought, what happens when you click circle in Uncharted? And I guess this is a bit more of an art form because you could take into account where the player is looking, but I just assume that the player wants to attach themselves to the nearest bit of cover. The nearest bit of cover isn't as simple as just finding the closest distance between the player and some average world space position of a, a, an object of cover. Instead, you have to consider the closest position that the player can physically attach to the cover. As you can see here, attaching to the closest world space cover actually doesn't return the closest point that the player could attach to. So with this in mind, I went with an approach where the player actually asks each cover object to provide it with the closest point that it could attach to. So the actual bit of cover asks each of its cover segments to, fi uh, to find the closest point to the player. And then the cover object as a whole looks at all of these points from each segment, and then it actually picks the closest one to the player. And this is the one that it then returns to the player. And then it's up to the player's job to pick the closest point of all of the different cover systems um, to find the closest bit of cover to it, and then will attach to, to that bit of cover instead. Looking quite abstractly at the system so far, this is the take cover function on the player script. And essentially what I did was get a reference to every single cover system uh, in the scene. And then for each one of those, get the nearest point that we can attach to. And then through this comparison of if current distance less than closest distance, it basically ensures that at the end of this for loop, um, the closest point uh, out of all of those returned points is stored in the variables like closest distance and closest point and all, uh, and closest rail segment and all of that kind of thing. So the player has all the relevant uh, information that it needs about what the closest rail system and that point is. And then we basically update all of its information and then the player is in cover mode. Not being too familiar with creating custom components in Unreal Engine, I had a look online about what the different components were that you could extend from and scene components seemed to be the best choice because they had a transform. And what I really wanted from defining the points on the rail were positional information and rotational information. Because I've extended this component, I was able to add on additional information. For example, the index that the point is in the rail system, for example, which is quite useful, um, essentially because I couldn't quite figure out why sometimes Unreal Engine was reordering the order of the child components. I assume because it shouldn't matter, so I added this indexing feature. And you can see me using that here to create an ordered uh, array of these cover points. So this is actually on the cover system uh, object, the cover system class, where its child components are the cover rail points, and it then orders them, and it'll then create the segments from it. So then we calculate the rail segments from these points, uh, but let's have a look at the rail segment struct. So these just have pointers to the two points that define them, and some cache information like the direction and length, um, and also the angle at the ramp. Uh, calculating the angle is a bit weird because we actually take the average of both points. Uh, their yaw is basically their rotation around their z uh, as well. And then there's this weird edge case where basically because angles can go from minus 180 to 180, if there has been a loop like that, uh, that's when bound yaw 1 minus bound yaw 2, the absolute value of that's greater than 180, then you actually have to flip it. Um, and I've, I've wrote this as the long way around, but um, you kind of have to draw out the circles and you kind of see that when you take the average of um, these two points, a negative and a positive, then you end up uh, having to take the opposite of that direction. 
I would also like to add that this does assume that there are no rotations between two points that are greater than 180 unless there has been a kind of loop around that um, uh, yaw from minus 180 to 180. Um, and that's because this system is not meant to be that there's one point with a rotation of zero and then the next point is a rotation of 180. You would have to split that up into kind of like a curve to go between those two rotations. So, yeah. I'd also just like to say that the um, variable names of bound yaw are kind of legacy from when I had this idea that you could just bind the angles between zero and 360 and take the average and that would solve all your problems. But as this diagram shows, that was not the case. So I will go back and change those variable names. So going back to calculating the rail segments themselves, um, rail segments is actually a pointer to an array of rail segment structs. This is because I wanted the ability to be able to wipe um, the slate clean basically of all the segments if the cover got deformed in some way we could rebuild them and essentially what we do is we go through the array of cover rail points and continuously build up these rail segments and the points themselves are shared between segments so the right point of one will be the left point of the next one for example um, and then uh, at the end what we do is if the cover is looping then we build another segment between the last one and the first one uh, provided there's enough points to even have a looping system in it. So we've already seen where this function has been called. This is the gets nearest rail point function on the cover system. And it just provides the point that is the closest for the player to attach to uh, in the entire rail system that makes up this bit of cover. And the first thing that we do is actually check to see if there is only one point in this entire rail system. So there won't be any segments. Uh, and this then just returns that point. This is because I wanted my system to allow for um, bits of cover that only have one point to attach to. The next bit of code is essentially the same way that the player sifted through all of its points to figure out the closest out of all the returned points from each cover system. Um, but instead, it goes through each segment and asks each segment um, in this rail system to provide the closest point to the player. The system then determines which of these points is the closest out of all of its rail segments, and then it'll return that point to the player. And then the player, as we've seen before, sifts through all of those points returned by all the cover systems. And to figure out the closest point on each segment, we use this nearest point on line function that you can see in the for loop. Um, this is just a bit of vector maths, uh, and I've wrote that out in the comments at the top if you're interested in how it actually figures out the closest point. But essentially, we figure out the lambda on this basically line equation. Uh, and if this is 0, then it means that the closest point on the line, if it was an infinite line, um, is not in this segment. So we return the furthest left point and the same for the furthest right point. If not, we return the position um, kind of between the two points with the relevant lambda that we figured out. And also looking back, um, this direction vector is definitely something we could cache as well in the rail segment struct, um, as well as just the normalized direction, which is already in there. Now moving on to how the player actually gets the movement vector to slide along the rail. So the player knows its segment ID, the bit of cover that it's on, and its current position. It then gives this information to the rail, as well as the kind of movement that the player is wanting to perform, like moving left, and by how much distance it's actually wanting to go around. Then the rail takes this information and calculates a movement vector. And this movement vector has to take into account if the player moves left and then actually moves off of the current rail segment, in which case we use any remaining distance to move on to the next rail. I also decided to divide this remaining distance by some damping factor to emphasize that the player is changing direction. This would probably cause some slowdown, and this just looked better after some testing, in my opinion. This functionality of sliding onto the next segment also had to be applied recursively, because it could be the case that the player moves onto the next segment and then instantly slides off that one onto the next one. There also has to be some checks depending on if the rail is looping or not, because it might be the case that there is no segment next, in which case the player should just move to the end of the current segment and stop there. Or if it is looping, figure out where the next segment is. And if it's the if we're on the end segment, then we slide back onto the first segment, for example. All of this information is then returned to the player, including the movement vector, the new segment ID, which is important if it has slid onto another segment, uh, and also the player's new rotation. The player then has the job of applying all of this and actually adding on the movement that has been given. Looking at the implementation of this, the cover rail system provides a get movement vector function, which takes in the player's current rail segment ID, the player's position, how much distance it wants to move along the rail, and whether it wants to move left or right. The first thing it does is check if it's a one point system, in which case it will return zero for the movement direction because you shouldn't be able to move on a one point bit of cover. 
So now assuming that the player is actually on a line segment, we get the left or right direction from the current segment, which was calculated when the segment was created in the first place. Uh, and then we calculate the position that the player would move, assuming that it stays on its current segment. So assuming that it doesn't slide off, where would the player be placed? We then put this position in a function called is out current rail segment, which I'll talk about next. But basically, it just returns true or false if a given position is between um, the two points that make the segment. And if this position is within the current segment, then all is good. The player stayed within the current segment. So just return the relevant movement vector, which is simply just the direction of this segment times by the distance the player wanted to move. And the segment ID hasn't changed. And we just simply return the um, yaw of the current segment too. Briefly looking at is out current rail segment, uh, we simply just input the position that we're looking at the segment that we're seeing if the position is in, uh, and whether or not we're seeing if this position is to the right or left of the segment, which we know from uh, if the player was trying to move to the right. And um, so say if the player was trying to move to the right, we would check to see if the distance between the position of the player and the left point of the line is greater than the length of the entire segment, in which case we know the player has slid off the segment to the right, so uh, we just return true accordingly, which is from this conditional check to see if it is greater. Um, I'm also using the squared length because that is more memory efficient than using any kind of square routing operation for calculating regular length, so that's why we cached the uh, squared length for the segment itself. Back in the get movement vector function, in the case that we did slide off of the current rail segment, we calculate the next uh, rail segment ID for the player. Uh, if there exists a segment to the right, then we can just uh, add one. Uh, but if we've reached the end, we check to see if we're looping, in which case we go back to the start. Uh, and this is basically the same in reverse for if we're moving left from the very start segment. And if there exists no segment to the left or right and we're not a looping bit of cover, then we simply stop the player in its tracks and returning an effect to zero. We could take the player right up until the end of the segment, but you get this kind of oscillating effect um, as the player kind of tends towards the end of the segment. Uh, and this works um, as I wanted to from testing, so um, yeah. If there does exist another segment for the player to slide onto, then we calculate the vector to take the player from its current position to the turning point uh, between this segment and the next segment, and we add that to the movement vector uh, so we call the function again, uh, but now giving it the fact that the player is starting at that turning point and the distance that we wanted to move is the remaining distance. Um, so uh, the kind of overall distance minus the distance it took for the player to get from its current position to the turning point uh, divided by four, as we previously talked about, uh, about trying to damp that uh, down. Uh, and we return the new rail segment uh, returned from that movement vector, uh, because of course it could be the case that the player slides onto yet another rail segment, so we want to make sure it's the most up-to-date segment. Uh, and then we also return that yaw as well. So now looking at how the player actually uses this, uh, when the player moves, if we are in a cover state, uh, then we check to see that we are actually attached to a uh, cover rail. Um, if we aren't, then we back out the function. Uh, the next what we do is we dot the forward uh, directions of both the camera and the player. Um, if these are greater than zero, uh, then the relative movement um, is basically is made negative. This is because if the camera is in front of the player, uh, then left and right is different if it was behind the player, and you want the movement of the player in the cover to be relative to uh, how the camera is facing, so kind of the user's uh, left and right um, as they see it on the screen. We then calculate the total distance that the player wants to move based on its speed, which is a U property, so you can edit that within Unreal Engine. Uh, we then contact the current cover rail system, give it all of that data we've talked about before, like its uh, cover segment ID, its location, the distance it wants to move, and which direction it's moving in. And this actually depends on the relative movement X, which we calculated earlier. Uh, and then we just update everything, uh, as well as this is cover faced right, which is a uh, ball which is exposed to um, blueprints and is used in the animation um, to determine if the player should do the kind of left idle or right idle uh, animation, uh, depending on if it moved left or right last. And speaking of animation, the essential part is this cover blend space, uh, which is updated um, based on the player's speed uh, and also based on uh, the is cover face right, uh, as shown before. And essentially, we cache this position um, to be used in the kind of greater uh, animation state space, the main events section. Um, and if you're interested in the maths of figuring out where um, that kind of pointer goes in that blend space, um, that's on screen now. And in the main state section of this animation blueprint, we go into using the cached um, cover position from the blend space 
uh, from this alias transition take cover. And an alias transition is essentially just a transition that applies to multiple states in an animation blueprint. Uh, in this case, uh, every state here. Uh, and the condition to take this transition uh, is that the player's traversal state has just updated to being in cover. And we saw that traversal state being used in the C++ movement function for the player as well. And finally, we can create new bits of cover all within Unreal Engine. By deriving blueprint classes from the C++ class cover rail, we can add in static meshes to create visuals for the bits of cover, and that will also interact with Unreal Engine's physics engine. Then add in our scene components for the cover rail points and give them an uh, index just so that we can order these points. And also, not really mentioned earlier, but when we create these, these have to be in an anti-clockwise order just to keep the ordering consistent um, so we can uh, know which way is left and right, for example. Uh, and as you can see, we rotate them as well. So uh, the yaw uh, for each point uh, works with the system that we set up earlier when segments are created. And just like that, you can then drag it in, um, the new bit of cover into the scene, and the player should just be able to uh, interact with them and use them. And, and that's pretty much everything about the design and implementation of the cover system so far. And I've got a few plans for improvements in the future, such as having bits of cover that have standing sections and crouch sections, and then building that data into the cover rail points themselves. And I also think this could pretty um, directly translate into some kind of climbing system, an on-rails climbing system, which is definitely something that I might do as well. Other improvements that I've had mentioned to me so far are using the spline component for placing the rails. And I've looked into these, and these seem like a really great way to actually, in the engine, define these paths. So that definitely seems like a really good feature that I could add in and would make editing these rails uh, much easier. If not, I could create my own debugging visuals for the rail system that I've created um, so far already, and that's definitely high up on my to-do list for this system. Other than that, thank you so much for watching. And if you have any comments, suggestions, or improvements, please feel free to leave those in the comments. Like I said at the start of this video, this is my first C++ and Unreal Engine um, kind of full example project. And um, so if there's any kind of weird looking lines of code where there's better practice or I'm, I'm not doing something quite right in uh, a couple of these places, I'd absolutely love to know. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video.